well-being is one of the objectives that St Paul's set out in its vision into action strategy around about a year ago. It was one of the key strands that we identified alongside transformation, mission and community. So in a way, Richard's book uh, and our embracing of it and this evening is part of the outworking of that of that strategy. So that puts it into some sort of context. But Richard, uh, I know you've been going and I, we to St Paul's for a number of years. We've known each other for many years. Mm. But I think it might be good if you could just start by introducing yourself, just saying a bit about a, a bit about yourself and your and, and your family situation. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Peter. I think most of the names I've seen on this list probably know at least a bit of our story. But I think for people who aren't quite so familiar. Um, yeah, we've been coming to St Paul's for 20 years, uh, 21 years in October. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, before we came to Hertfordshire, we'd lived in, in Oxfordshire and never settled at any church. We'd been to all different denominations of church, never quite settled anywhere for any reason. Came to Harp to St Albans, went to St Paul's in the first week, looked at each other and said, no, it can't be this easy. We'll go somewhere else next week just to check. And we went to St Luke's, I think, <laughs> this week instead. And then we went, no, we'll just go to St Paul's, that's fine. So we've been here for, for 21 years in October. Um, uh, I have four boys, as I think most of the people on this uh, call will know. Um, Luke, Josh, Finn and Zach. Luke is 24, Josh 21, Finn 18, Zach almost 16. And Luke features quite prominently in, in the book uh, because he was one of the, he was the one of the, Thing, people that motivated me to write it um, because he has severe complex epilepsy and a learning disability and his story and our family's story is one of the things that I wanted to tell and to, to illustrate um, the book with so that's that's us. And you, you, you are a, a GP you've been a GP for more than 20 years and and given that perhaps right at the outset I, of, of this uh, conversation I ought to ask you how has Covid been for you and I think right at the beginning if I recall you actually had Covid really quite uh, quite badly. Yeah um, it seems so long ago now but we, we got it in, in March Becky and I March 2020. Um, I, I don't know whether it was from a patient or more likely my, my horrible children I should think because uh, everyone was still at school in those days weren't they and, and no one was uh, isolating. Um, I, I, and badly, I guess, is a relative term. We didn't end up in hospital. I'm very grateful for that. Um, but yeah, I, I probably sh theoretically I should have done because my oxygen saturations weren't very good. Um, but I stubbornly stayed at home. Um, we were unwell for a couple of weeks. Becky um, developed some symptoms that you might loosely term long COVID. Um, she, she's generally quite well nowadays, but you know, she's had some complications there, including sort of tiredness and heart palpitations. I recovered quite quickly um, within a few weeks, but then um, got a bit of a sort of arthritis thing a few months later, which is now gone as well. So that so that was challenging for us because we were all everyone was really scared about COVID, weren't they? Last last March, I mean, gosh, we were all terrified. We were trying to get prescriptions for hydroxychloroquine and goodness goodness knows what to have at home. Um, and having recovered from it, it's um, the year certainly in general practice has been very challenging. If I'm honest, it was quiet for about a month, maybe March to April 2020, when people just were really staying at home and not bringing anyone. Got busier and busier. And, and now, despite what the Mail on Sunday says, it is it is insanely busy. And I think busiest in 20 years. And I think part of that is COVID because of the huge burden of mental health that we've seen arising out of that, which we can always talk more about in this conversation. Um, but also because COVID is a very inflammatory disease, I suspect people are now beginning to develop other problems that they might not even be aware are necessarily COVID related. But now and over the next few years, I think we're going to see more and more consequences of that. And of course, we have long COVID as well, um, which is affecting people. And then we've got the vaccinations and people either wanting them or not wanting them or wanting advice about them. <laughs> so it's um, it's been a very challenging year for us as a uh, for all all practices yeah and in the midst of that very challenging year of all that busyness somehow you've managed to write this this book as well so congratulations on being able to put that 
together in, during that really hectic time. And so the book's about wellness and how would you define wellness? It's, it's a word one hears so often. And today I, I, I came across a wellness courtyard that's oh. been developed uh, locally. Right. Uh, yeah, a wellness courtyard, isn't that lovely? Perhaps they should have named it after you, Richard. It, it does sound very uh, nice, doesn't it? Yes. That's, it's wonderful, isn't it? I must um, go visit so, so what's your definition of what wellness is? Well, I think, as I say in the book, it's, it's a very well-being wellness. Let's use the terms interchangeably. It can be quite woolly, quite fuzzy. Um, I would say loosely. People might define it as very, perhaps a little bit too simplistically. You could say happiness. You could say satis life satisfaction, um, feeling fulfilled, feeling physically well, feeling mentally well. Um, <clears throat> I think it's all of those things rolled in, rolled in together. And I think to be well, and you and I have talked about this quite a number of occasions, Peter, it's about feeling well in, in body, mind and, and soul. I think unless you think about all of those dimensions and don't try to artificially separate between them, which I think we have done historically, both in secular society and in my view in the church as well, um, then you are potentially missing out on a big bit. And I guess if they're legs of a tripod, you know, you know what happens to a tripod if you've only got two legs. Um, so loosely, I would I would you know describe it in those sorts of terms and the fact there isn't even consensus on whether it should have a hyphen in the middle or not tells you how um how debated it still is at the moment you you chose to write a book about wellness but isn't that a topic where if you go into shops you see lots of books on 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 the subject and it's it seemed to be something that's been around you know it's very popular the last few years what specifically did you think that you could add to this this debate Richard? Well, that's a very pertinent question because there is a lot of stuff out there it is trendy at the moment I hope it remains trendy for the foreseeable future um, and there's loads of books written by doctors and you know uh, personal trainers and health gurus of various descriptions uh, and, and I realized that you know I was very unlikely to suddenly come up with something new about sleep and movement and food that hadn't been at least written about before. So the, the, what I was aiming to do with the book was to bring what was at least five years full of obsessive learning and reading and listening to podcasts and talking to people, distill it down to make it quite broad. So it's not a book on sleep or a book on intermittent nostril breathing. It, it, it's a book on general well-being, which I think a lot of the books are quite specialised and quite deep and not everyone's got the time for that. But also the thing that I do feel I've brought to it that is different, if not unique, but at least different, is the purpose and meaning aspect of it. That's why I called it fit for purpose. I wanted to have, have people think about health and fitness and that purpose should be part of that. And I wanted to write about faith as well. And I, and I knew that by doing that, it makes it a little bit niche, perhaps. Um, but I'd never seen anything like that before and I'd, and I'd searched on the internet and there weren't many titles, <clears throat> at least not recent titles, that, that served that purpose. Um, and my faith is part of my life and, I, and I, it helps me um, as part of my well-being. And so I wanted to do something which would both say to the secular society, I really would encourage you to think about this, let's not you know, in the modern age where it's very easy to deride faith, let's just take a moment to think about why, why it might actually be valuable. But I also wanted, if I'm honest, to be, and again, you and I have spoken about this before, to be quite challenging to the faith community and say, you know, have we, have we perhaps, just as the secular society has maybe ignored faith, have we given physical and mental well-being its due when it comes to thinking about what it means to be fit for purpose? And I from personal experience, I feel maybe perhaps that has been a bit neglected. Because when I think about wellness, and when I see the way wellness is marketed or communicated around, it, it's always felt to me to be a very, I don't know, secular I, mm. idea. I haven't seen a spiritual dimension, or if I have, it's not been a, a Christian dimension, it's perhaps been a Buddhist Mm. or an eastern religion mm. dimension how how do you feel we should be addressing that as 
as Christians? Is it something we're missing out on? Is it, is it something we should be preaching more into, doing more about? So. Absolutely. You know, if I once went to uh, Cornerstone Church in Nottingham, I mentioned this in the book, where Peter Lewis, bless him, uh, preached for almost an hour on two words from a, from a Bible verse. Um, that will, that finished me off at that stage. Uh, <laughs> I felt if it took you that long to talk about your material, you needed to think about what you were doing. Um, but, you know, if, if you can have someone preach to you for an hour about, you know, a very small bit of scripture um, that is one aspect of, of your well-being in life, why wouldn't you talk about things like physical movement and eating and relationships and sleep and drugs and alcohol and and and, you, and your sense of satisfaction and purpose in life because you know we can all turn up in church on a sunday morning looking our shiny best when now we're heading back towards times where such a thing is allowed um and the emphasis is very much on the spiritual and yet we know that behind every face in the congregation there's a story, there, there's a life, there's, there's, there are struggles, there's been, an, there's been an argument in the car on the way, or you've had a terrible week at work, or you're really struggling with something. Um, and, I, and I think it's really important to, to address that, because otherwise we're going to church for our spiritual recharge, but we're neglecting the other two you know, legs of the tripod. And, and I would argue that you, you, know, you, you can't be we can't achieve our full potential as humans if we ignore our humanity, just as we can't do it if we ignore our spirituality as well. So, so I think it is something we should be addressing. I think it's something we should be talking to the community about without agenda because we're Christians and we're spreading God's word and we're showing God's love. I think it's something that leaders should be talking about um, and leading by example. I don't mean that every leader should be clad in lycra and have their body mass index checked before a church service and that we should all start off with a little bit of high intensity interval training but I do think there should be an honest conversation about our lives how we're living them what's good what's not so good what areas that we're struggling with or would like to improve sharing stuff being honest I think that's really important and if we don't do that I think we're not going to be all that effective I think for me I think for me Richard one of the um most challenging points of the book as someone who does find himself standing in in front of church and standing at pulpits uh, is how those of us in those situations model some of the issues that uh, that you talk about in in the book in terms of in terms of wellness mm. uh, and I think you give an example of being in a church one morning and and looking at those who were at the front of church yeah. uh, and, and and thinking that perhaps just perhaps they weren't modeling a sort of healthy uh, lifestyle um, and I was thinking oh gosh was I at the front that morning and <laughs> to, to think about that so so in a sense here, here is here is the pulpit for you um, if you were to give us at St Paul's or anybody who is who is uh, going to hear this this webinar and watch this webinar on, on YouTube perhaps at a later stage what would be, I don't know, your three top tips for us to lead a healthier life, to have a greater experience of wellness? What, what might they be? You're going to confine me to three. And there'll be people at home watching this going, he's carefully prepared this. And um, <laughs> that may not be quite the case. Um, if I were to try and confine it to three or so, I would say, first of all, do think about your well-being as a whole. Um, Think about your spirit, your mind, body and soul and, and treat them as equally important. Um, if there are, there might be lots of things in your life that you want to change and it can feel a bit overwhelming because you might think, gosh, you know, I want to lose weight. I could do with sleeping better. I drink too much. My relationships aren't great. Um, you know, um, my diet's wrong. Uh, I'm all over the place, you know. It's, it's just too much. It's, it's overwhelming. And it's like someone standing at the foothills, looking at the top of Everest, thinking, oh, I'm never going to get up there. So my second tip would be, <clears throat> well, the second tip would be be kind to yourself, because I wouldn't want people to think that just because of the comments I made about how I've sometimes perceived people to be leading or not leading by example. Um, we're not perfect. We're working on it. Um, be kind to yourself. Don't beat yourself up. But then 
think just about keeping it really simple. You might just change one thing in your life. You might say, I'm going to go to bed an, an hour earlier and turn my phone off. You might say, I'm going to get up a little bit earlier and go for a walk every day. You might say, I'm going to do five minutes of mindfulness each day. You might say, I'm going to download the Lectio 365 app onto my phone and, and do a little meditation. Um, if not every day, then whatever, two, three, four times a week. Um, <clears throat> so keeping it simple, I think, is, is important as well. Um, and perhaps share, being honest and sharing things with other people, because if you want to make a change in your life and you tell other people that and you let them support you and even be your, your referees who are there with your permission to maybe even nag you uh, or at least ask you questions, that that can be something that you're more likely to, you're then more likely to achieve the, the goals that you want to, to achieve. So those would be my very broad tips without going into any of the specific areas. I would say the last thing I might say is for me, actually, I think two of the biggest determinants of our well-being in life and it's not sleep or what we eat or how we move or whether we're stressed or relaxed, although all of those things are clearly important and some of us struggle in those areas particularly. I think relationships and how we connect with others and purpose and meaning in life, I think are really really important and i think if you've got those two sorted out a lot of the other issues can be can be managed or, or improve as a result of of having good relationships and having purpose and so spending time to sit down with yourself and ask yourself some big questions about what what fulfills me in life um <clears throat> am i leading a, am i living life in a way that's consistent with my values are there things i need to change about my relationships or my job um how would i do that and, and obviously, you know, think about the spiritual aspect of that. Ask God what he has to, to say, but also be, you know, co common sense. Um, I don't know if we're going to get onto the question of talking about healing, but uh, I, you know, it, it, this process doesn't need to be miraculous. God gave us brains uh, to sort of apply a bit of common sense and do a bit of thinking. And sometimes I think we, we dress it up too much and make it too mysterious and miraculous about how we look after ourselves. As, as you know, that's one of my... Um, pet peeves. I'm going to return to that, but the what you've just said is really interesting because you've said two key things uh, that could really improve people's wellness. One is relationships, which in the church we might use the jargon, I don't know, fellowship or community. Yeah. Uh, and the other is is purpose and meaning in life, which as Christians we would find in Christ. So it would seem to be that churches are, I don't know, really well placed to be mm. promoting wellness because we are places of community, we are places with, with a particular meaning, a, a gospel to preach yeah. uh, in, in, in Christian terms. So in a sense, what, why do you think it is that churches haven't particularly been seen as places where I don't know, doctors might be prescribing people to go to on a mm. Sunday to improve yeah. their well-being. So I think, it, first of all, to comment on what you said about it, yes, I think churches are well placed. There's good evidence to in the scientific literature that shows that having a sense of purpose in life, and specifically having uh, a meaningful faith that you practice, as opposed to just a badge that you wear, um, do make you live longer. You're happier you're less likely to have a heart attack or a stroke or suffer from dementia. Um, uh, you're more likely to survive things like cancer or HIV. So there's good evidence for that. Um, why haven't we done it? I mean, I'm not saying this specifically of St Paul's, just to be clear, I've been to lots of churches over the years, <clears throat> but the risk I think is that the, you know, the church should be a club that exists for the benefit of non-members. Um, I think it was Rob Bell who said that in Velvet Elvis. Um, and there is a risk that church can be a cosy club that, that serves its members and becomes inward looking and not outward looking. And without wishing to go over ancient history, I think we as a church, we are now in a very exciting place with new leadership and changes and new ways of doing things um, and using our existing strengths and people as well to really, really do that. And, and you know, I suppose phase one for me was, was St Paul's being you know, rebuilt all those years ago. Um, it's a long time ago now, isn't it? Um, and, and I think, you know, 
for me that there's a really exciting opportunity here to really grasp that and, and I have to be honest I don't think we have done that yet as a church fully I'm sure there have been some bits I don't know about but I think that's really exciting and I, and I think um, doctors should be uh, talking to patients about it um, it's, it's a conversation that you have to be sensitive about so I might ask people you know do you have any let's say we're having a conversation about a life-changing diagnosis or even a life-shortening diagnosis I might ask them do you have any um, in terms of purpose and meaning in life do you have any beliefs or philosophies that are relevant at this stage and they might say yes I do and then I might say to them well you know why, why don't you go and talk to your vicar or would you like to be put in touch with a chaplain or whatever um, I wouldn't necessarily offer them, I wouldn't necessarily uh, take on that job myself as a GP, I wouldn't promote my faith unprompted because the good general medical council has some uh, fairly stiff things to say about that, but it definitely has a place and um, you know the Lancet published an article about that and said you know that spirituality should be is a tool that you should consider in a consultation so yeah I've, I've been all, I've gone all around the houses there but I don't know if that answered all your questions. That's, that's really helpful. Um, I'm going to, in a moment, um, invite others to come forward with questions uh, arising out of what we've talked about or other issues, or perhaps if they've read the book, some points from the book. But I, I do just want to ask a question. You, you touched upon it a bit earlier on, which is, in a sense, the place of, of spiritual healing, yeah. um, where uh, many churches, not just ours, will pray for healing mm. uh, for, for people. Um, is there, where does where does that come that's not is that let's just get this out, out there this isn't something that you um discount or would be skeptical of you'd perhaps see it in a in, within a spectrum of of holistic healing in 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 different ways is that is that fair richard absolutely i, I fully believe in in healing i absolutely believe that god can do miracles According to the dictionary definition of a miracle, <clears throat> I don't think they do happen every day and all that often. Um, so my view is that it's great to pray for that. We, we've prayed for my son to be healed ever since his epilepsy was diagnosed uh, 18 years ago. And God has not yet answered that very simple prayer in that way that we would have liked him to by you know, making his epilepsy go away. Um, but I think that um, the risk of emphasizing when the risk of always using the word healing in the context of the miraculous is that ultimately it can lead to disappointment it can lead to some very dodgy theology where people thrash around to explain why healing has not occurred i've seen that in st paul's and in other places which is um you can understand why but it's intellectually a bit sort of cowardly um and it's not accepting the fact that life is difficult and we don't always have the answers or we we find that we want to we end up blaming people for their prayers not being answered instead of just accepting that the miraculous doesn't happen every day. But actually, what about if a person loses weight and they cure their pre-diabetes? Well, that's amazing. That's going to change the rest of their life. And it's, I would argue that's more miraculous than finding your car keys at the last minute or some of the things that occasionally you know, do get shared. Um, so I, I believe in the miraculous, but I think God's given us our minds and our bodies and, and, and medicine and, and all the other things that are available to us. Um, and so I, I would encourage a strong focus on, on self-help and yes, asking for help when you need it. And there are lots of you know, prayers, good and fellowship is good. And there are lots of things that are good for you, even if you aren't miraculously healed when you go out to the front of church and talk to the prayer team. And I'm not wanting to discourage people from that. But, um, yeah, I. I'd like to see more of a discussion about sort of simple, everyday, non-amazing healing, but it is kind of amazing, really. I think what I'm hearing you say there, Richard, is it's not one or the other. It's 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 both. Yeah. It's both and absolutely sort of working together in a complementary yeah. uh, way. I yeah. still pray for yeah. my son to be healed. Um, you know, God's answered prayers in other ways that perhaps we weren't thinking of or asking for. Um, but yeah, yeah, I agree. It's a, it's a mix of all of it. Thank, thank you. Richard, thank you for all those uh, answers to questions and the discussion around around that. Um, Al, can we open up the uh, screens now? Is that how we're doing this? And give folk the chance to ask questions if they well, if we they can. to. If folks, if people do directly want to ask questions, please just turn your video on, your pop on, and obviously turn your your mute button off. If you don't want to actually be recorded, 
just pop your question in the chat directly and Peter can actually take it from there. If anyone does ask me a question, I've got a special device that I use to let them know if they haven't turned their microphone on. I'd, I'd like to ask if, if, any, uh, if anyone, and I know quite a number of people have read the book, if there is any particular points or any feedback on the book they'd like to give Richard while he's with us. Mm, I'd really uh, value as well, that. As, as well this evening. I think we've stunned them into silence, Peter. Here we are. So Mike, Mike Wilkins asked the question whether you're thinking of running seminars on this topic. Well, we've, we've talked about that, haven't we? Um, a long time ago, Andre and I, and I talked about it uh, pre-COVID. Um, um, and I think if there was an appetite for it, I know that um, the Sunday morning one I did a while ago was, was fairly well received. So uh, I think that is something that we could certainly consider. Um, yeah, absolutely. It would, obviously, it would. Inv I need to talk to to you and Andre and, and others about it. But yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to do that in, in whatever way. And and people's suggestions about what they would like. You know, um, I think some of the feedback from last time was great. Loads of stuff, but an awful lot to to fit in. So we might want to maybe make it a bit shorter and more focused. And we could do particular topics. Another question that uh, from from Claire. What can we offer visitors in the way of hospitality instead of cake? <laughs> yeah, it's a good one, isn't it? Um, I mean, I did make the, the point. Just in the to book. say, there's, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with cake. I love cake. I think yeah, I think you are in addition to cake. Hopefully, everything in everything in moderation, including moderation. I, I think if I had to take a step back, I would say the most important thing is that we are offering hospitality and that we are uh, a welcoming place that people come in through the doors. For whatever reason because they're coming to collect some food or they're coming to join a, a a group that rents the church or they're coming to mother and toddlers or whatever uh, and so you could argue that probably the most important thing going back to my comments about connections and purpose and meaning is that th it, we're a welcoming place and, and i wouldn't necessarily lose any sleep over whether people are serving cake but um it is an interesting thing isn't it because if you were if we're talking about well-being and and all we offer are um cakes and biscuits and bacon butties although don't get me wrong I, I do like a bacon butty uh, at the right time um yeah maybe we should be thinking about you know can we offer healthier options would we offer <clears throat> more in the way of you know fruit and vegetables and you know nuts and um other sort of perhaps less kind of calorific or sweet and sticky snacks um perhaps you know to, in recognition of the fact that some people are struggling with their with, with health issues and um, church should be a place where they've got the option to eat well um, if that's an issue for them. So I think just having a, perhaps a slightly broader menu choices doesn't need to be expensive. And, and then we should think about other things as well. So <clears throat> for example, when we do our community days, you know, and, and I think we have done this to some extent, what are you laying on? Are you laying on activities that involve physical activity? Um, are you using the church building to get people moving? Are you hosting an event where everybody sits at a chair, which is fine if you're sort of frail and elderly or unwell? Or are you thinking about, well, actually, we're going to do this so it's more of a standing event or a walking event? You know, we could walk around Clarence Park whilst we were talking about something. Um, and that applies, of course, to um, the internal workings of the church as well in terms of the youth groups and the senior leadership meetings and all that kind of stuff, just integrating all those simple practices every day into our lives. And I guess what, one of the things we've seen under lockdown, um, it has been a range of activity groups starting up in the church and, and the walking groups have been one of the most popular and, mm -hmm. and, and continue so to be. Brilliant. I'm going to move on because you've got quite a lot of questions coming in, which is great. Yeah. Uh, next one from Andy here, Andy Thompson. You talked about us not yet fully embracing the wellness ag agenda in the church. What might that look like if we did? So I think we've kind of covered some of those areas already. We might <clears throat> look at the, the content of the you know, sermons and, uh, and talks. 
whatever. I don't, I don't really mind whether you call them sermons, talks, webinars, whatever. Um, in terms of making some of the content perhaps a bit more practical about day-to-day -day well-being and put that on a, on a footing with things which are perhaps seem to be 100% spiritual, as it were, and, and having more conversations about where the two cross over. Um, and, and, you know, um, opening up the church to groups that will promote um, some of those kind of sort of healthy, healthy living, even if those aren't necessarily Christian groups as such. Um, and, um, you know, more stuff for our young people to think about those things. Um, I would have, you know, those, those kind of things. And as you say, developing all the stuff that's happened in the church already, so more walking stuff, um, just, just leading by example, really, across the whole of the, of the community. You, you touched on young people and, and, and uh, there's a question about whether there's something specific for, for youth around this topic. Mm. Uh, and I guess both physical and mental, thinking of the pressures and mental pressures that yeah. a lot of young people are are under with social media, online bullying, all that sort of thing. I think there's specific stuff for our young people, and, and um, it may be that that's already being addressed with with Rachel in 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 post. But I think that's a real issue that that we should have maybe a, a few sessions on a course or whatever, um, looking at the mental health side of things and understanding that actually. Good mental health does does include things like good physical health with nutrition and sleep and, and relationships and that kind of thing um helping them to, we've, we've developed quite a toxic default environment for ourselves whether it's the way that we go to work the way that we use social media the, the houses that we live in the way that our towns and cities are made and it takes quite a fight back to actually push back against the more toxic default environment and so i think having those conversations with our young people about things like social media and mental health and tying it all together, I think is really important. And I know that actually, in fairness, kids have always charged around, haven't they? You know, ever since I was a teenager, you know, people don't tend to go to a club night and sit still. They play football and rag hockey and table tennis and, and chat and whatever. But, you know, it might be thinking about things like when we do a weekend for youth, kids don't do very well early in the morning particularly if they stayed up all night having pillow fights and midnight feasts or whatever. So how do you lay out the day? Maybe you don't have the first session until 10 or 11. Maybe, maybe you don't have someone, you think about what you do in the graveyard shift of two or three, and this applies to kids and adults, and that you might want to make that a physical activity rather than a, a conversation. You might have, when you have the meetings with them, you know, part of it could be physical activities together, simple inclusive stuff, you know, not a full on exercise class but just incorporating all of those bits, chucking in some mindfulness and some meditation. You mentioned Buddhism, Peter, and as you and I are both well aware, that is a tradition, but the, the Christian faith has a long-standing tradition of mindfulness going back you know, over a thousand years. So it, that's nothing to be, to be worried about as Christians. That's a real, um, a real positive. Just picking up a, a comment that's, uh, that, that's, that's come in. Uh, having read the book, I was struck by the way you made everything attainable. Recognising small changes can be significant. The book is very accessible and something I'm happily recommending uh, to lots of people. So thank you. That's from that's from Marion. That's a good, good bit of thank feedback, you, isn't it? Uh, and and Marion, if you haven't already given it the five stars on Amazon, that would be much appreciated. <laughs> and other books, book uh, platforms are obviously available as well. <laughs> But thank you. That's, that's, what, that's what I wanted to achieve. There's a question about doing more um, well-being seminars at church. Have we have we covered that to an extent? We've talked about that, Richard. Right? Yeah, um, we might well return to that. And uh, what we might want to do, thinking about it, Peter, as well, is to um, not just have me waffling on for however long, but looking at what sort of people we might want to bring uh, in, into the church to deliver that. And, you know, why not? I mean, great, let's have Christians talking about this stuff, but actually let's get some people who aren't necessarily Christians in to be part of that development because it gets them into the church. It, it, it's um, potentially good for them. Um, it helps us to build up maybe a network of practitioners who can help and support each other. You know, we could, have, we could end up with a St Paul's wellbeing network where people know who they can go and talk to when they need a bit of help and advice and, and you know not just the purely spiritual it sounds like you're you're volunteering for something very I significant just, I just made that up 
Yeah. We're, we're hearing yeah. that. We, yeah. we've, we've heard that. Andre is also on this call, so he's no doubt making notes as well. Um, what about mental health? A uh, question on the mental health front. Yeah. What more could we do at church? Uh, one success has been home groups. Yeah. And I think that's been one of the things we found through uh, through lockdown is is the robustness of the mm. uh, of, of of the home groups. Uh, do you have any more any any ideas around promoting mental health? So things I recommend <clears throat> for good mental health, and we could think about how we then incorporate that. I think making sure that people have got enough sleep is a really good one. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I mentioned in the book is that you you would not look kindly upon a, a, a leader of a church turning up to preach drunk or hungover, but actually turning up knackered, having not slept properly, you're no less cognitively impaired. And in fact, we sometimes make a bit of a virtue of it, don't we? Because we're sacrificing ourselves on the altar of spirituality. And I've been up all night doing whatever, and we shrug ruefully and we carry on, but actually, uh, we shouldn't kid ourselves. We're not doing anyone at a service there. So talking, helping people to make sure they're sleeping well. I think looking at people's relationships is really important. Um, helping them to look at what their network is like. Do they have close friends that they can talk to and, and rely upon? Um, I think helping people deal with stress and relaxation. I think we could look into that. You know, going back to the issues about mindfulness and um, the different sort of ways that we can learn to reduce the fight or flight reaction in our lives the, the sympathetic drive from our bodies and put the brakes on with things like breathing exercises and, and looking at how we incorporate that into into prayer for example um, so those are and then but also practical things so in our church we have christians against poverty um, you know lots of the reasons that people are feeling depressed or anxious is because of those external factors so let's not just pray for them which is great but let's also find out, you know, like social prescribers do in general practice, what are the different things in your life that, are, that might need addressing? Can we as a church help you with that? Or could we at least point you in the direction of the person that, that can? You know, we don't need to be all things to everybody. We don't need to replicate services that already exist, but just that kind of holistic thought at the back of your mind. Um, so I think those would be uh, some of the things I'd look at for mental health. There are others. But. A question from from Karen around uh, agreeing that a lot of the things you talk about in your book are relevant for youth, and even more so with current issues with mental health and the increase with this from COVID and isolation. Mm. I think something for them, uh, young people, um, perhaps even more generally, uh, would be would, would be great. And I think that echoes what you were saying earlier on about your experience in the surgery. Mm. That although COVID if you like, we can perhaps perhaps see the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. But actually the tunnel is much longer because we've got great mental health issues coming out of it. Is that a fair characterization of what you what you were saying? Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, and I think we, we may not have seen, we probably haven't seen the peak of it yet. And people will be doing a lot of readjusting. You know, there are people now who could go back to work, who can go out into the streets, who can hug their friends and family. But actually there are a lot of people saying, I don't really want to, I don't feel, I don't feel ready yet. People who are still, you know, stuck in their homes, um, and they're missing out on relationships as a result, which in turn will have an adverse impact on their mental health. So, uh, the, the church does provide potentially connections in that situation, doesn't it, for people who are in need, whether it's putting people in touch with each other who are neighbours or inviting people to come and have a cup of tea in our nice new concourse. Um, yeah, I, th I think there'll be plenty of work for us to. To, to be done and there's a lot of people out there who maybe won't attract the attention of medical professionals because they're not severe enough to end up calling the doctor or taking pills but they're their level they've never really worried in their lives before and now everyone's level has gone up so the people who were never worried now are a bit worried uh, and being able to help those people before things begin to spiral out of control I think is quite is quite important what about the connection, asks Mike, between nature and well-being? How, how, how does that line up for you, Richard? Yeah, I think it's fundamental. You know, um, the, the Japanese have a term called forest bathing. They even have forest medicine, actually. Uh, they acknowledge the importance of nature in sense of well-being. Uh, and I think there's added meaning for us as Christians because we, we, we see the world as being created by, by God. Um, so that you mentioned the walks have been popular you know where do walks take place generally 
usually in an area, or at least some of the time, which is green. Um, and so it's, it's tremendously valuable, even just five minutes in the morning, getting outside with a cup of tea in your hand, if you're lucky enough to have a back garden, just standing there, you know, enjoying the greenery, listening to the birds sing, watching the wind in the trees, being grateful for those things. One of the things I forgot to mention was the practice of gratitude in dealing with mental health problems. Some people have started their recovery from significant anxiety and depression just by finding three things every day that they're grateful for. And that sounds so simple, but it is absolutely true. So, so yeah, I think using, using nature as part of that, and we're, I think we're quite lucky in St Albans, we've got quite a bit of greenery around us, haven't we? Um, is, it's obvious, it's simple, it's free. Thank you. Um, there's a question about whether the book is being promoted through St Albans Diocese, through church uh, channels, because there's a, there's, a, there's a message not just for St Paul's, but for many, many churches. Are, are you aware of other churches um, that are interested in this area and are get, get, getting involved, Richard? Uh, not, not so far. That's a good point. And perhaps it is a conversation that I'll have with, with you offline <laughs> later. But um, as you know, from our conversations, we, we've we, uh, there have been discussions with other organisations like um, the Guild of Health and St Raphael, who Andre and I spoke about um, uh, what, a year or two ago, who are interested in, in promoting it. Um, and I've, I've done a bit of a blog for them, uh, etc. But yeah, locally, that's a, that's a good idea. I've done loads of other stuff that I won't bore you with, um, but uh, yeah, thank you. That's a good suggestion. And in a sense, to, to, to half answer the question, some of the things that Richard and I have been working on uh, in the last weeks uh, do include you know, articles that have appeared in Christian circles. Yeah. And uh, I think there's a, uh, an interview in Church Times coming up at, at some stage in the yeah. near future, which, which should involve Richard, well, probably I mean Richard, we stopped in the street by people and uh, and mods and things like that. I imagine it's... millions of people read the Church Times probably. Um, but no, but you, Peter has been brilliant. I'm going to embarrass him slightly by saying this, but he's been amazing. In fact, you've done a better job than uh, some of the team at the publishers, to be honest, in uh, securing uh, conversations with with really really um, you know, relevant people and organisations. So that's been very helpful. We've got about 15 minutes uh, left. Uh, I think either David and Tara, or maybe just Tara, or maybe just David have joined this, this call. Uh, and I, I wonder if it would be uh, impertinent to give, if it is Tara, or maybe if it's David anyway, to to, to just have a comment on uh, a Christian perspective of, of well-being. Are you there? Well, if, if they are, they are being very coy, if I can say that. Unusually coy, if, I may, if I may say that. <laughs> they, so, they, we're coming, so do, if you have questions, do, do uh, submit them or raise, or raise your hand. Ah, they've gone off mute, so can we? We have. It took me a little while to find out. Tara's not well. So it's just me. So I, no comment from me. I'm sure Tara will have a comment at some stage. I, I will leave you to report back to to Tara, but I, I, I'm pretty strongly of the view that I think Tara would uh, support very much the agenda around well-being. Yes, uh, as, yes. As, as well. Yeah, thank, thank, you. Th thank you, David. So going forward, um, as we come towards the end of this evening, if there if there were some key messages for us to take away from tonight. So if somebody stops us in the street tomorrow and says, were you on that webinar with, um, with Richard? What did, you, what, did, what did he say? What is it that you'd like us to answer that question in a couple of sentences, Richard? I think it would go back to what we said before with the top tips. Think about your life from the perspective of mind, body and soul, um, all being equally important and one not doing well without the other um, and when you're thinking about your spiritual life don't forget your your physical life as well and that they do go hand in hand um, give yourself the chance even if it's five minutes once a week or an hour or you know if you're lucky enough have a half day here or there 
to, to really sit down and think about life you know your, your purpose in life what is uh what is satisfying what, what is fulfilling what do you what you might need to do more of what you might need to do less of because life can be so full on can't it it can be a, you know we talk about the rat race it's just and and more than ever it's full on 24 hours a day the boundaries that are being blurred because we're not you know we're all working from home etc well some of us um give yourself that gift of, of a little bit of space a little bit of time like um John Paul Comer talks about, you know, margin in the ruthless elimination of hurry um, just to take stock, because if you don't take stock, it'll be quite difficult to know, you know, what you want to get out of life. And obviously that taking stock could include praying and putting stuff in front of God and asking for advice um, and guidance, but also trusting that um, sometimes uh, God does move in mysterious ways, but also sometimes he moves in some frankly quite obvious ones as well. Uh, and, and it may be that you know, the answers to some of your concerns about your well-being are right there in front of you. Uh, and if you think, well, I know the what, but I'm, I'm struggling with the with the why. Uh, sorry, the how. How am I going to change it? Um, you know, get some advice, get some support, whether it's chatting to your friends, to uh, someone you look up to in the church, uh, a leader, whoever. Um, or if it is a significant health issue, um, then, you know, talking to your doctor about it. There's um. View, view it as part of the whole and so it's all everything is interconnected Richard I shall having having sort of put the book on display there I'm going to wave it in front of the camera here thank you <laughs> and uh, this is this is a rare unsigned copy of of the book yeah um, how remind us how we can get hold of a copy if we want to so want to can, do that Richard well I understand first of all that there's an option through through church, through Brenda Parkhouse, is that right? Um, you'll be able to say a little more about that, I guess, but from, from my perspective, um, you can get it from the usual places. So Amazon, Waterstones, Google, um, you can get it on Kindle, and you even have the pleasure, if you wish, of listening to me read it on Audible. That may be something that you do or don't like the sound of. Um, and uh, you can order it from any bookshop, and then there is the option, as, you, as you, you've managed to I think arranged Peter or spoke to Brenda about. Is that right? That's right. So, so Brenda Parkhouse, who is an independent bookseller within our church, can obtain copies of the book, and then we can you can collect them from church or or from her. Uh, and if uh, folk would like to contact me uh, direct, uh, I I can uh, pass them on to Brenda. But I I know uh, that quite a number of people have bought copies from Brenda, which is uh, which is excellent. Uh, I'm just having a quick look to see if there's any final can questions. Can I just mention one other thing, Peter? Um, Please do. Uh, as part of promoting it, but because I wanted to do it anyway, we've, we've, I've now got a podcast. Um, the podcast is called Wellbeing for Real Life. Um, you can find it by searching for that or just my name on any of the standard podcast apps. It's on all the directories now. And we've, we've got seven episodes. Uh, it isn't specifically a Christian podcast, um, but it, it covers the topics that, that are discussed in the book without being overtly promotional. Um, they're conversations, so it's not me talking to you for 25 minutes. They're, they're 20 to 25 minutes, so they're quite digestible. Um, three of them are with a colleague of mine who's a consultant cardiologist called Asim Malhotra, who's a, a well-being expert with a national platform. Uh, four of them are with my friend Wendy, who's a GP and an expert on mindfulness, and one of them is specifically devoted to purpose and meaning as well um, and um, you can subscribe to them and follow and if you do like those then giving those a nice five-star review would also be helpful. Richard, thank you uh, and just to flag up but uh, Andre has put in the chat very good discussion lots of great ideas agree that we need to heal the dualistic split between the spiritual and the relational and physical lots more conversations to be had on how to do this in a church context and I think that's a conversation for St Paul's but I think uh, perhaps a conversation for really every church from what you've been saying Richard I think you yeah. very powerfully communicated the the importance of all-round well-being uh, and really the key role that we as Christians as Christian churches um, have to contribute to this debate and I think we have been from my perspective, uh, the church generally uh, very silent uh, around this whole 
area. So I think I, I found your book very challenging as well as being very accessible. So Richard, thank you very much for giving your time this evening. Thank you for writing the book. Thank you for being part of the St Paul's family and for everyone who's taken part this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you for all those who've joined us. It's been a really good evening and uh, see you again very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everyone.